Father, the Holy Spirit be with me. Let my words be your words. Let the words allow us to have a realization of what is happening. And I ask these things for Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, Linda and I went to a movie, and it was called the uh, Revive Us 2. And after that show, I was so inspired by the Holy Spirit to preach upon the single word, unity. Now, unity is a state of not being multiple talks about oneness, coming together as one. It's a condition of harmony and being of one accord. It's continuity without any type of deviation or change. It has a purpose and an action to be in unity. It's a quality or a state of being in a unification being unified, being together. Which brings me back to our roots. When our nation was first founded, everybody in this country was united. Why? Because they came together as one nation under God. A couple hundred years ago that was. And Satan's not happy about that. So he's put a lot of spikes into it. So now we are no longer one nation under God. That is no longer the case today. As I look around, I can see our nation is terribly divided. And it's only getting worse. Satan's winning that war. That's why I want that armor of God up there every week. He's out there winning that war. And I see this division getting worse and worse and worse. But before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about some examples of unity where we, we, get, we actually have a bond of unity without even knowing that we're doing it. But we do it. I'll give you an example. We have men and women who come together from all walks of life, and they decide to join the military because they believe that, you know, going in and really helping the cause, fighting for our freedom is very important. So they decide to join the military. And they go to basic training, but they really haven't been brought together. They haven't been unified yet. They've all come together. They've all been trained together. They know how to operate as a unit. But it's when they're on that battlefield. When they're on that battlefield, they are pulled together, just start dramatically in a, in a unified fashion, for one purpose, to defeat the enemy. They were trained, but nobody told them when they went out to battle, you're a unit. They just operated that way. They have each other's back, and they're out there. Another example where you're, you're unified subconsciously would be uh, if you're a member of a sports team. There are, off the field, the individual players, they're individuals. But when they come together, and they get out on that field, whatever the sport is, they become unified, or on purpose, to beat the other team. So they've unified themselves. And when we're talking about sports, let's talk about the fans. You've got thousands and thousands of fans that come into that stadium. They don't know anybody else primarily, maybe a few friends that they came with, and they, they're, they're, they have nothing in common until they all start cheering together and high-fiving each other, right? They become together in unity, large masses of people in unity, cheering their team on. But nobody told them to do that. They just, by default, unified together for a common purpose to cheer your team on. Unfortunately, as I opened up, I said there's really no unity in our country today. The people are divided. Our government, who's supposed to come together for the best interests of the people, are divided. Congress is divided. The House is divided. 
There's race issues out there that are being thrown in our face. Really? You know? They're, Satan's out there just trying to pull us apart. And I, 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 it, just, it just bothers me to see all of that. So as I repeat, this country was founded on unity of one nation under God. We need to get back to being that united nation under God and change our ways back to biblical principles. That's what it's all about, to get all back to biblical principles. Where, and where does that change come about? That change come about, it starts in the home. If there's no unity in the family, then how can our country be unified? Parents separate, or there's arguments, they don't agree upon how to bring the children up, they don't agree upon things. The men are not taking that spiritual leadership role and bringing their families together in a unified fashion and teaching them about the Lord, it's all going away. And in order for it to happen again, we've got to make it happen back in the homes. I don't even think there's unity in our churches. Christians are letting their biblical foundations slip away by not taking a stand. We're not voting. I recently heard that 80% of Christians do not vote. Ouch! Ouch! If we're, if we're carrying that word out and we want to have our religious freedom, we're letting the others just kind of trump us a little bit, so to speak. You know, we need to get out there, and I pray that, that we can be unified and come back to our biblical values again and take advantage of these things that God has put there for us to raise a voice, become unified as a Christian nation, to take a stand and help fight that evil one out there. The early people in the church knew why they existed. You ask people around today, do you know why you exist? Most people really couldn't give you a good answer. But they knew why they existed. They were unified with one purpose. In the book of Acts, it reads, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They had unity together to spread the good news about Jesus. They were of one heart and one mind to spread that good news. Now Jesus had enlisted these twelve, and he enlisted them not to a life of leisure, we all want to have leisure and comfort. Now, we're not enlisted to a life of leisure. We can be blessed with some comfort, but we're not enlisted to that. We are enlisted to a life of service. So he enlisted these 12 to a life of service, and they took that on. While each had a different task, they all had the same calling. We all have different tasks, but we all have the same calling to fulfill the Great Commission. And they fulfilled the Great Commission in their generation as we need to do in our generation. They had one leader, Jesus, one purpose, to communicate the gospel to all people. These early disciples did more to spread Christianity than any other generation that followed on. And they did it without the modern means of communication that exists today. You always hear me up here saying, did you share a website? Did you have somebody look at the Facebook? They did it by word of mouth. They did it by beating the street. They went out there. And they touched more hearts and souls than any other time period. Wow. I'm like, wow. They really did that. So what was their secret? What was their secret? As I said, they had unity in the church in <laughs> Acts 4.32. All the believers were of one heart and one mind. All the believers shared in this unity. Not just the apostles, but all the people they touched. Not just the leaders, but all the believers were unified. There was a fundamental solidarity of love and purpose. Love, the key word. If we feel that love, we know what the purpose is. And they were to be in one heart and one mind to be unified in every fiber of their being. We come together in church 
because we love the Lord. We have one purpose, to give Him praise, honor, and glory while we're in church. That purpose is to carry that out in the world when we leave here. They were a family in relationship. They shared the same spiritual father, don't we all? They shared a spiritual birth. We were born again. They were born again into the family of God. You were all born again into the family of God. They were friends in fellowship. They shared their lives. They shared their possessions with one another. As I see people in this fellowship, too, we share time and we share things and we're helping people. But it went beyond. It goes beyond just a kind word to somebody. It goes beyond that. They gave priority to meeting the physical and practical needs that were evident in the community as we're trying to do with this fellowship, to meet the needs of those people in our community. You all heard of Chuck Swindle, right? Well, Chuck Swindle wrote, churches need to be less like national shrines and more like bars. <laughs> okay. Less like untouchable cathedrals and more like well-used hospitals. Places to bleed in rather than monuments to look at. Mm -hmm. Places where you can take your mask off and let your hair down. A place where you have your wounds dressed. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about it, you know, when I, when I saw that, this is like, like a bar, really. But you know, well, where are you going to go out and touch a salt? Where are you going to go out and meet somebody? It's usually in an establishment with alcohol and food. And that's where people, that's where I have some of my best witnessing opportunities was when I'm out to dinner with somebody. It's amazing. The disciples, they were also followers of Christ in partnership. Have we become a partner with God? Have we said, I'm going to partner with you? They became, these men and women shared this whole enterprise together. They did not assemble to merely have a gathering to feel good or gathering for physical needs. They came together in order to agree on the objective. These men and women were partners in reaching the world for Christ. That was their objective, to spread the word. We are all commissioned to spread that word. Members of a church are people from various backgrounds and different interests and different perspectives who have been called together for that purpose. We all have different backgrounds. We come from different ethical groups, different educational backgrounds, but we're called together for that common purpose, and that is to reach out beyond these four walls here and share that love with others that you have, the love of Jesus Christ. Let them know that you have that joy. We are in life-saving business. Every one of you is in a life-saving business. We're out there to save a soul, save a life. And that endeavor is accomplished best when we understand that we are a family of God in partnership with each other. Partnering with each other. I was just talking to Pastor Don about going out and doing a little bit of evangelizing. We're going to partner together, and we're going to go out and we're going to hit the streets. That's what it's about. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians to encourage and exhort the people of Ephesus to value the church. Value the church. Value what you're learning here. And in chapter 4, he turns attention to unity in the church through verses 1 to 6. He gives us the basic outline and pattern for maintaining unity in the church, because that's where it starts. Being a family, we're a church family, this is where it needs to be. And it reads, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a family worthy of the, a life worthy of the calling you have received. Hmm. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What's our calling? Our calling is to go out and witness every day. Every one of us is called to witness to God. As we do that, to be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Think about those words. Be humble, not prideful. 
be gentle, <coughs> but most importantly, be patient. People aren't going to change right away as we're going out there, but be patient so that we can show them the love that we have. It goes on to read, it says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The bond of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is available to everybody who is out there to accept that Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a peaceful spirit. It's the loving spirit that we want to have out there. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. One God, one Father. So we're all called together to be unified. There's not many out there. It's one. We share one common faith. We're all baptized for one common reason. As I said, we need to get back to our roots and rethink about our purpose. If somebody ever asks you, what is your purpose? Well, my purpose is to spread the good news. To touch somebody else out there. To tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. That is my purpose. All the other stuff around it is perhaps what we've been blessed with. My purpose isn't to go to work every day. My purpose is to spread the good news every day. Now there are some prerequisites to unity. Having the right attitude. If you don't have the right attitude, you're not going to be able to go out there and fulfill that purpose. Right? You all talked about having the right attitude. And having that right attitude will allow you to be content and to actually help promote unity. Content, hmm, yeah, that's a tough one. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Wow, wow. You know, people are always content when things are going real good. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm laid back, I'm content, I'm happy. But how about when things aren't going so good? It's hard to find to be content with the situation you're in. You have to find something to be thankful for. Amen. Find an element of joy and be content with that thought. Not with the circumstances that Satan is surrounding you with, but with the knowledge and having the faith that he is there with you. Be content with the fact that you know that he loves you and he is with you. He wrote on to say, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So just as I was saying, Apostle wrote on to say, he knew, he experienced it all. And I'm sure in our congregation, a lot of our folks have experienced it all. We've experienced those times of good. We've experienced those times of love. Are you content in both situations? Mm. Here's the kicker. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So as I said, have that Holy Spirit with you. No matter what those circumstances are that surround you. And have that Holy Spirit give you the strength that you need. Now, if you are not content towards yourself, think about this. If you're not content with yourself, then you're going to, to, to display disharmony amongst others. If you're not content with yourself, you're going to deharmonize groups that you get with. You try and pull them down. And then, then all of a sudden unity starts to fall apart. So being content is a key component for the unity. Love is the final key component for unity. Love is the first and last and everything in between for unity. And in 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1 verses 13 to 14, Alright, I want to start out with, um, yeah, 1 Peter, I'm sorry. 
Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, you set your hope on grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. How can you be holy? By having that love. If you don't have that love, you certainly can't be holy. It all kind of ties together. Everything interweaves with each other. Then in Romans, we talk a little bit more about love. In Romans 12, chapter, chapter 12, verses 9 to 13. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. That means putting others ahead of you. Don't love yourself first. Don't be looking in the mirror saying, mm, do I look good today? Love yourself. I'm not. You want to be humble when you're looking at that mirror. Look at yourself in the eyes and try and stare and see what would Jesus do. Have the Holy Spirit be with you. Continues to read, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Keep that fire going, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Joyful, patient, faithful. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now when we talk about sharing the Lord, with the Lord's people who are in need, I'm also talking about just physical needs, spiritual needs. Everybody has that spiritual need. There's... There, they're, they're lacking. They, they, they believe in God, but they need that little push. They need that little uh, spike that you can bring to them. They need to see that joy that you have. They need to see it so much you're going to say, I want that. I want a little bit of that. Where do you get all that energy from? Where's that joy coming from? I want some of that. I'm going to help make my day be a little bit better. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Now, living in harmony with one another, I'll use another word. Live in unity with one another. We have one, one Father. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So don't say, I'm not going to talk to that person because I don't like the way they look. I'm better than they are. Uh-uh. We're all created equal. Everybody needs some comfort. Everybody needs some love. And I, I get it's unfortunate out there. Everybody's judged by how they look. You know, whether or not we're going to embrace that person or accept that person. But Jesus says, love everybody. It's what's in the heart. It's not mm -hmm. what's on the outside. It's not that physical look. It's what that person brings in their heart. So don't be proud. Associate with everybody. And of course, do not repay evil for evil. Mm. Be careful what to do. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Think about that. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. But most importantly, what is right in whose eyes? God's eyes. You can be doing stuff all by yourself that is not pleasing to the Lord. It's right in his eyes. And if you're doing things that are not right when you're by yourself, how can you expect to do things that are right when you're with others? You're just going to be like that rotten fruit corrupting the barrel. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. No matter who they are. How much of a pain you might deem them to be. Some people in family, oh, we got this member or that member, you know, whatever the case might be. It doesn't matter. Show them the love. Show them the joy. And be at peace with them. If there's any conflict that they want to bring and introduce, diffuse it. Agree to disagree, diffuse it. 
Start to live in harmony, live in peace. It starts in your home, it starts in your family. It continues to grow in our church. And let us bring our nation together again. One nation under God. Amen. Amen. Amen.